Good morning. The flowers on the altar are given by the Altar Guild to the glory of God and memory of Corinne Conway and Jean Morrell. We start with our land acknowledgement. We take a moment to acknowledge that we gather on the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape peoples. We acknowledge the often overlooked indigenous history that long preceded colonial times and continues today. We recognize the millions of people today who identify as indigenous, including people from South and Central America who live in our area. Our order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of the Holy Amen. Amen. When we were laid low by sin and guilt, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us all our trespasses by taking our sins to the cross. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Rejoice in this good news. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts, that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Russell, if you'd like to come read our psalm. How are you doing this morning, everybody? I'm going to read from the book of Psalms 98. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing with trumpets and the blast of the man's ram's horn shout for joy before the Lord the King. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Please be seated.
A reading from the book of Exodus, starting at chapter 14. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff, and you stretch out your hand over the sea to, and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his, and in his servant Moses. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Holy wisdom, holy word. The Good News According to John, the eighth chapter. <clears throat> Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Martha and I spent the early part of last week in Rotterdam, New York, sitting with our grandson, Betty, while his parents were at work. As you know, and many of you have met Betty, he is an energetic seven-year-old on the spectrum, and he expresses all his love through energy and running throughout the house. But it was not hard work because we love Benny dearly and the house has been thoroughly Benny-proofed. He is very good at entertaining himself and he has free range to explore all three floors of the house. All we do is put food in front of him when he is hungry and make sure he doesn't try to elope. During the time we were in Rotterdam, Martha, who is superb at multitasking, was keeping an eye on Benny and an ear on a Lutheran Zoom class for intentional interim ministers. When Benny was quiet, I eavesdropped on the class to get some free education. One of the lecturers was Todd Bolsinger, Vice President of Fuller Theological Seminary for Vocation Formation and Assistant Professor of Practical Theology. Todd was using biblical references to illuminate challenges pastors may face 
with their congregations. But my ears perked up when Todd asked, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible before the resurrection? Well, my mind raced for an answer. Was it Noah's ability to squeeze thousands of animals into a handmade boat? Was it Daniel in the lion's den? Was it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surviving in the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar? Was it Balaam's talking ass? Was it David slaying the giant Goliath with a slingshot? But the answer should have been obvious to me, given our biblical studies this month. The greatest miracle recorded in the Bible prior to the resurrection was the parting of the Red Sea. So the Israelites could escape Pharaoh's advancing army at the subsequent closing of the waters to drown the Egyptians. It makes me think of a story we used to tell in Baptist youth camp about a little boy returning home from Bible school. What did you learn today? His father asked. We learned how the children of Israel escaped the king's army, the boy said. Oh, good. How did that happen? Well, the Israelites were trapped on the edge of the water. They could see Pharaoh's army getting closer. Go on. And the people were so frightened, they begged Moses to help them, the boy said. Go on. Then what? Well, then Moses brought out a hundred pontoon boats and the people got in them. And when they got to the other side, Moses called in helicopters and they sprayed Pharaoh's armies with Tommy guns until they were all dead. And the people said, yay, Moses. The father looked at his son quizzically. Is that what the teacher told you? Well, no, but if I told you what the teacher said, you'd never believe it. Unbelievable, perhaps. But that is the nature of miracles. You don't believe what you're seeing with your own eyes, even when God's power is vividly on display. Professor Bolsinger's reference to the miracle of the divided waters was a device to study the sociology of congregations and their pastors under stress. When they were sweltering under the heat of oppression, the Israelites endorsed Moses' platform of let my people go. They stood by him through 10 plagues, even the last one in which they had to scramble themselves to protect their firstborn by smearing lamb's blood on the mantles. What a horrifying night that must have been for everybody, including the Israelites, as the angel of death descended on the whole land. How many Israelites went to bed thinking, I hope this works. I hope I smeared enough lamb's blood on the door. Maybe I should go outside and check one more time. But it happened as Moses had promised, and Pharaoh freed them, sending them out of the land of bondage into the bright light of freedom. It was their Independence Day. Moses was the great emancipator, the hero of the hour in the Israelites, patted each other on the back, congratulating each other for choosing such a wise and productive leader. They stuck with Moses as he led them on unexpected routes, following a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night so that they could keep moving. They trusted Moses when he told them to move and when he told them to stop, when he told them to change directions, they trusted Moses when God rerouted them, though the people didn't realize that God was setting a trap for Pharaoh by making it appear that they were wandering aimlessly and seemed to have no effective leadership. Seeing that the people had no clear destination, Pharaoh, influenced by hardening of the ventricles, resolved to go after the people one more time. When the Israelites saw hundreds of chariots advancing toward them, they reevaluated their assessment of Moses as a leader. In an oral memorandum entitled, We Are Concerned, the people said this, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die 
in the wilderness. What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone so we can serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Clearly, Moses' church council is having second thoughts about the direction in which they are headed. But Moses, who is not the sort of pastor who seeks compromise with the factions in his flock, stands firm. He doesn't exactly tell them to shut up, because that would be impolite. But he, clear, he declares, the Lord will fight for you, and all you have to do is keep still. What happens next is recorded in Scripture with almost understated simplicity. That Moses stretched his hand out over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall on the right and on the left, and then the Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh had followed them into the sea, and not one of them remained. Not one of them remained. Well, we've heard the story so often, we tend to miss the sheer awesomeness of it, the greatest miracle of Scripture just short of the resurrection. So let's take a breath now and consider in our minds the power of God that is on display here and say to ourselves, wow. But the march toward freedom must have been confusing to the Israelites moving first in one direction, then in another, marching, standing still, marching again to the edge of the sea. Corey Driver, assistant to the bishop for emerging ministers and ministries of the Indiana-Kentucky Synod of the ELCA, puts it this way. There were so many confusing reversals in the process of being freed. An ancient Jewish commentary compares the rescue at sea to a man walking alone with his son on a dark night. They walked single file to remain on the narrow road, and when the man sensed a thief ahead, he moved his son behind him to protect him. When the man sensed a wolf behind him, he moved his son in front of him. And when both a thief and a wolf approached at the same time, the man put his son on his shoulders to protect him from both threats. The son, no doubt, felt confused and being jostled back and forth by his father, but he trusted his father to keep him safe on the dark path. But confusing as it was, God did not fail the people as we follow their 40-year pilgrimage to the promised land. We shall see confusion again. They wandered in so many different directions The one humorous imagines Moses saying, recalculating, Recalculating, reading on, we see that many more occasions when people doubted, when they were confused, when they kvetched, when they rebelled, when they resolved to fire Moses, and even worse, when they tried to replace the Lord God of Israel with a golden calf. Sometimes it was too much for Moses. As in Numbers 11, when he cried out to God, I am not able to bear all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. This, Bolsinger observes, is a case of post-traumatic church syndrome. But as a leader of a congregation, Moses must realize how deeply his people are affected by the confusing twists and turns of the journey. We've all been through these ups and downs. Martha and I celebrate the joy of children and grandchildren, and perhaps you have too. But we've also grieved when close friends lose children to diseases, birth mishaps, traffic accidents, 
or overdoses. And perhaps you have too. I have celebrated professional successes, promotions, the odd journalism award, but I've also been fired by nonprofit church organizations that could no longer afford me. I've celebrated relative prosperity, but I also know what it's like to live hand to mouth in stringent times. I've celebrated the love of parents and grandparents, but I felt the pain of watching loved ones succumb to cancer, to cardiovascular disease and dementia. Life is confusing. It is not unusual for any of us to blame our spiritual leaders for failing to teach us that life has its ups and its downs. And every day with Jesus is not necessarily sweeter than the day before. You think Moses' people had experienced enough in 40 years to know the journey will not always be smooth and it will not always be Moses' fault. Corey Driver writes, as we walk along the uncertain path of this life, God's leading can be deeply confusing. Make no mistake. God calls us all to freedom from sin and death, including freedom from structural sin, like Egyptian slavery. But sometimes the path is confusing, and our act of faithfulness is to stop standing still and crying out, and instead to move forward into what the Lord is doing. And when we were able to see the marvelous good the Lord is doing, it's time to celebrate and to dance. Remember the words we heard today. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing, and Miriam began to sing to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Life is not easy. And sometimes it is very hard, as the migrating Israelites do. But in the end, they clung to the hope that would be sung by the psalmists who came after them. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people on page five. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Almighty God, hold this world in your tender embrace, especially those impacted by the opioid epidemic. Each of us has a way to serve you by loving and helping our neighbor. Remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. God of love, loving Savior, hear our prayers for the places of flooding and wildfires. Help us to reach out in assistance. We pray for people in war-torn countries, victims of terrorism, both foreign and domestic. We pray for and reach out to refugees in compassion. Holy Lord Jesus, the stranger among us, we pray for the misunderstood and marginalized. 
God of justice, bless our child care center staff, advisory committee, and families. We thank you for this inspiring mission to and with our community. May we each discover how the talents that you have graced us with can be used to your glory. God of joy. Holy Lord, hear us as we join our prayers together to lift up Angie, Merrick, Bill, Pam, Max, Julia, Dan, Dennis, Earl, Erica, Marcia, Rick, Bill, Jamie, Muriel, Kay, Adalia, Julissa, Pat, Bob, Suzanne, Johnny, Carlene, Michael, John, Tessa, Linda, Sandy, Dan, Ernesto, Deborah, William, Connie, Michael, Patrick. Lord, in your mercy, bless all who mourn the loss of loved ones, including the family of Betty Ann DeLuca. Bless Victoria and Fabian who are expecting their first child. Bless all those recently baptized, especially Cora. We rejoice for those celebrating birthdays, especially Wendy, Heather, Ben, Eileen, and Patty. God of love, bless our Metro New York Bishop Paul, our Synod staff and Synod Council. Bless our choir and musicians, altar guilds, lectors, communion assistants, ushers, acolytes, deacons, and greeters. Bless our congregations, leaders with wisdom and vision. May we reach out to other houses of worship and community partners and discuss how we give praise and honor to you with lives shaped by your mercy and steadfast love. God of joy, we lift these and all of our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. Our usher, Don, is going to come forward with our offering plate. You can raise your hand if you'd like him to come over to you. In the bulletin, we list plenty of electronic options if that is your preference. Our offertory prayer. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with mercy and grant us peace.
I want to say hello to Norma, who's joining us online this morning. If you get a chance to stop by the laptop and say hello to her. And also this morning, you may see that we have our Bishop Paul and his wife, Marianne, joining us. And we're so happy to have you here. You're always welcome at St. Paul's. A reminder to look in your bulletin, the Interfaith um, Psalms Bible study that we're doing with Temple KTI starts this Wednesday. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. And also a reminder that our congregational getaway at Camp Koinonia is coming up. The information about that is also in the bulletin. God sends us now with a message and a mission. Marked with the cross of Christ forever, we are claimed, gathered, and sent for the sake of the world. Go in peace, welcome the stranger. all right that's why it's not picking, it's, um, really yeah right. i thought i didn't know i was the only one that knew how to do it really oh 